Okay, yeah, let's start. So it's great to have uh, Ulgbek Kamilov here uh, giving uh, this uh, talk. He uh, received his uh, degrees from uh, EPFL, uh, working with people like uh, Michael Unzer, uh, Martin Vetterly. He's currently an assistant professor at uh, uh, Wash U in St. Louis. Uh, he works in uh, computational imaging, uh, applications like MRI, radar, uh, microscopy, and interested in the algorithmic and statistical characterization uh, side of things. And we're just really happy to have him here uh, speaking today. So take it away. We're all going to turn our cameras off just so we make sure we have the video, uh, that we don't slow the Zoom system down. All right. Uh, I hope it's okay with you if people interrupt, maybe, uh, with questions. It's but then perfectly most of fine. us will save our questions for the end. That's definitely fine. I, I actually started sharing my screen so we get the That's slides. Perfect. perfect. All right. Okay, so, take it away. All right. Thank you for introduction and thank you for actually listening into my to my talk. And before this talk, I was you know thinking hard what are the three things people in my area, which is general imaging, computational imaging, biomedical imaging, you know, think about. So the one thing right now is, of course, uh, hand sanitizers, there is toilet paper, but of course, also deep learning. And uh, the thread of my talk today will be kind of trying to combine uh, what we see in machine learning and what we see in traditional um, uh, imaging techniques. So this is what, you know, I'm going to try to focus on. And um, to kind of really focus on the thing what you know what i have been really interested in is try to use neural networks in the context where we have some understanding of what they do we don't have perfect understanding and this is still an open question but try to get somewhere we get some form of uh, leverage in a controlled domain such that we know what's happening and there is this one question that i usually start my uh, talks with because it's general curiosity and the question I was always asking is, um, for people in this audience, right, the deep learning is something which is really has been hot for the past few years. And then there are two extreme perspectives. A, it's a massive bubble that will be gone within one, two years. Or B, the universe will not be the same uh, after this whole uh, deep learning business. And actually, if you have a chance, if you look at this side here, you can even take a little poll and I'll share the results of this audience here afterwards. And I usually do this everywhere where I go. Here's actually an example when I asked this on Twitter where you could see the division between the, the it's a bubble versus uh, the universe will be not the same again. And of course, uh, the, you know, the, the more nuanced answer would be, it's you know, somewhere in the middle, uh, it's a technique, it has a rich, interesting theories that we can leverage, but it also brings us a lot of new tools to try to address some of the important problems that we care about. And this is, you know, is going to be the focus. And the focus I'm going to talk about is really going to be in the imaging. So if I would think about uh, uh, the general area of uh, imaging, you know, historically, my perspective, I would kind of divide it into three stages. So there is, you know, originally imaging was very much a, a hardware exercise, where the goal was to map a point somewhere in space, so another point, I don't know, somewhere on the eyepiece or on the screen or somewhere else. And that was basically all about designing a hardware so we get a very good representation of what we want to see uh, in the eyepiece of a microscope uh, versus uh, the actual object that we care about. However, then once we got these beautiful computers that allow us to do the zoom right now, uh, the perspective a little bit changed. So now we could actually record everything and do some form of signal processing Kind of to improve the performance. For, for example, we could boost the signal we wanted to, we could filter things, uh, we could denoise things, so that was kind of the next step of the, of the chain where we could do this uh, image process. And now what's happening now, and in fact many people uh, in this audience, and I know that because I follow many of your works, uh, is that we're moving to the third stage, where now information coming from the device, or the instrument here, does not only get used on its own, but gets combined with information being aggregated from other data, okay? We, there's some aggregated information and we combine it with the output of the instrument to try to retrieve something which is hidden or buried deep inside this information, something that would be inaccessible without this information. And machine learning is really the powerful tool 
to do this form of data aggregation because given data sets, we can put this all into some form of machine learning models. And this is really the, the, the perspective that I have. Now, when I talk about this in general imaging, what I'm really gonna focus all about is uh, today in the talk is about uh, the problems of inverse, pro inverse problems, which is something which is probably quite familiar to many of you here. So inverse problems, basically the perspective is there is unknown objects that we don't know, this is X. There's instrument that I characterize through this uh, operator H and it could be linear, nonlinear. It depends on application. It's very much instrument specific. There is some form of noise due to some uh, in, you know, imperfections of the hardware or the nature of the data being collected. And basically the easy problem is basically understanding pr uh, problem from X to Y easy in the relative sense, in the sense that once you know the instrument and its physics, you kind of can characterize this map from X to Y. However, what I really want to talk to you about is the inverse problem, which is a, the more challenging problem where we try to go from Y, which is what we acquire as data, to X. And then there are many reasons this is challenging, and you know, I'm going to talk about this in a second, but this is what we really want to try to address today, inverse problems in the imaging. Now, the reason this formalism, it's actually a general formalism of inverse problems is very useful, is because many, many, many imaging systems can be represented and formulated as inverse problems, right? Now, once you take inverse problem perspective, you move out from you know, taking pictures, which is in traditional photography, to making pictures. So it all becomes, you know, making a picture becomes solving as some form of inverse problem. So here you have some examples, and we're going to talk about that in a second. Okay, so let me give you two concrete examples we're going to talk about today. And those two examples are based on the projects that I've been actively working in the past couple of years uh, here at WashU. So the first example is magnetic resonance imaging. I'm sure it's familiar for many people, but basically in magnetic resonance imaging, the data is not collected in the image space, like in photography, but it's collected in the so-called K space, which is essentially the Fourier space, the frequency space of the data. And basically it's collected sequentially. So you collect the data and by taking inverse Fourier transform, you can form the image. So that's MRI, it's pretty straightforward, has been well studied in different contexts. And of course, it's not only 2D modality, we're really gonna talk about 3D modality where you can do the same thing, but now you're gonna collect uh, frequencies also along the, the slices, uh, uh, along the, some axis, and then you can still form a volumetric MRI image like you see on this image on your right hand side. Okay, and there are different ways to collect the data in the case space. It could be uh, radial acquisitions, Cartesian acquisitions, and so on and so forth. All right, and the second application I want to talk about is uh, optical diffraction tomography. It's more related to computational photography, which is just like X-rays, but we move to optical illumination. So we use light instead of X-rays, so uh, laser light, for example. So the goal there is we have a 3D object we want to see, and really what we really want to have inside the volume, in every point here, I want to know a number, and that number is a refractive index distribution. That's what I'm really after. This XR is a distribution of refractive index inside the sample. Now, I cannot directly get it non-invasively, so what we're going to do is do something like X-ray. We're going to illuminate the sample with some coherent illumination, uh, collect the data somewhere else outside of, it could be reflection or transmission, but you know, we put the camera, we collect the light, of course, it's going to be discretized measurements. So each point here is a, a what value you have in CCD. And basically, that's your measurement, Y1. Okay. Now, in principle, this measurement is an intensity measurement. So unless you have some form of interferometric setting, uh, what you measure is just the light intensity at the camera plane. And basically, inverse problem is trying to recover XR. But in fact, we don't have only single measurement. To compensate for losses, we do something like tomography where we take a bunch of images. So we take array of measurements where now in my hard drive, I store all these illuminations and giving them, I want to get back the 3D image. Now here's the nature, it's important to highlight, you know, we take hundreds or sometimes thousands of such images to form one 3D volumetric image of a sample, so refractive index distribution of the sample. Okay, so those are the two, two examples that I'm going to really talk about today, but there are many others that we can use the same formalism to address. And what are the challenges in solving this things, right? So uh, one common challenge that you hear about often is the slow acquisition time. And this is really the nature of data collection, which is important. In traditional photography, I take an image and I get the image. But in many problems I'm discussing here, in both cases, I have sequential data collection, which is indirect. Indirect means data is not the image domain, but in some other domain. Sequential means I need to collect data in sequence to be able to work with. So here's the case in MRI. 
And this is an example in optical tomography where you have a bunch of projections. And here I show you the phase of the light after it's been retrieved from interfer interferogram. Okay. Now, the second challenge is imaging artifacts. And there are many reasons you might have artifacts. But the really uh, practical problem uh, is that because you have subsampling in the sense that you cannot get fully sampled data, there might be model mismatch. You believe the instrument to behave one way, but reality is unfortunately doesn't match your model. And finally, there's all kinds of different noises, uh, for example, white noise because of sensors and so on. Uh, so here's a, one example we're going to see today, which is uh, if you do one free breathing MRI scan of a person, so here's uh, a, a single slice, and this is another patient. So you can see those are lesions inside the liver. If you do a scan over one minute, you're going to see something like this, which are known as tracking artifacts, because the data is heavily undersampled. So in this case, we're trying to collect one scan, it's free breathing, and get 10 motion phases. So what you see here are one slice, but across 10 motion phases collected together. So this is for one patient, and this is for another patient. Okay, this is an example. And this is the most scary one. This is from optical diffraction tomography. Uh, the if you model light interaction, if you don't take into account light scattering, uh, that's a model mismatch. You have two identical beads the Z is optical axis. If you put them in and you try to see the image, what you're going to see is that asymmetric beads. This is not true. In fact, they should be identical two beads uh, in the around optical axis. And you can see one is smaller than the other after image reconstruction. The reason is we're not modeling nonlinear interaction between the two objects. And here's a two identical yeast cells. This is also artifact, which is scary is that if you would use this for scientific imaging, uh, you wouldn't be able to trust the type of images you're obtaining. So you need to deal with a model mismatch in this case. And finally, high computational and me memory requirements. So here you see, uh, um, in this case, for example, in the 4D or 5D MRI scans, we end up with data which is 100 gigabytes uh, order, right? And it can be even more. I'm starting this new project about light sheet microscopy. And there, basically, the data we have is two weeks worth of uh, scan of a cell with two seconds sampling in time. So you know, there the data is really, really big. So we need to be able conscious of these three things, right? So how do I address this thing? So in this talk, we're really gonna talk about trying to put together a framework which combines physics and learning as information sources, right? And it's really based on my three recent papers. They're all online. I'm happy to share with people who are interested. But we're gonna take the statistical perspective where we're gonna model the, the um, instrument through a forward model. So you can see this is probabilistic thing, probability of x, uh, y given x. And this basically bakes in everything we know about the instruments, statistical model, uh, acquisition, sampling, and so on. And then on the other hand, we also have the prior. And basically, the algorithm will try to leverage the two sources of information together. So why do we need the forward model? Well, it's physics of data acquisition. And we really need it for two reasons. We want to correctly interpret the data we collected. And second, if there are known so error sources that we can actually calibrate for, we want to be able to do this. We don't want to blindly learn things. We really want to bake this in. And in imaging priors, we really need them to compensate uh, for the fact that problems are ill-posed to reduce acquisition times, collecting less data, incomplete measurement, and noise measurement. So basically, that's kind of an overview of how we're going to uh, address this talk. We're going to try to combine uh, measurement models of the instruments and some machine learned information, which we're gonna use as a prior information. Okay, so that's how it's divided up the talk. I'm gonna start up with the general imaging as an inverse problem, a quick review, which is gonna be useful to give us a perspective that I'm gonna build on to then go to actually using deep learning within regularization by artifact removal framework. And then we're gonna talk about how to try to scale things up by designing more scalable algorithms. And that will be the last part. At some moment, I might decide to skip the last part, but we're gonna see. The big focus is going to be on the second part of this talk, which is on regularization by artifact removal. All right. So um, I want to really get started with one single problem, which is image denoising. And there is a really nice reason to do it. First of all, it's already an interesting problem for many ways. So image denoising is basically the simplest in some sense problem, but which gives us intuition why it's important to have priors, right? In image denoising, you have something which is Z, which is a noisy observation of what you want to have. So X is what we want to have. E is unknown, undesired noise. And what we want to have, what we have access to Z. We don't have X and E. And unfortunately, this is impossible to solve because we're trying to split one thing 
into two things. It's impossible to solve unless we have some extra information. And this is really, you know, sends home the message we need the prior knowledge. So how do we, people typically do this? They kind of use image denoisers as a function for separating signal from noise. And there are many, many contributions in the area of image denoising. Basically, here's how I want you to think about, right? Image denoiser is a function, it's a mapping from a more noisy image to a less noisy image. So if you have something like this, hopefully afterwards you have something like this, which reduces the impact of E and boosts the X, okay? That's what denoising is. And in fact, I wanna spend a second to talk to you about one specific type of uh, image denoiser, which is a proximal operator, okay? It might be familiar for many of you, but some, it's not familiar to everybody, but it's something extremely useful. So what is a proximal operator? It's an image denoiser, okay? But it's an image denoiser which can be specified as this specific optimization problem, okay? So here you have an optimization problem. Z is an input, it's a noisy thing, and you try to get output a denoised image. So you can see it has two terms. There's this term, and then the second term is tau times h. So if tau is zero, I don't have this h, the output will be z itself, which means there is no denoise. If I start increasing tau, I'm gonna get more and more denoised image. So that's what you see here. Proximal operator, as you increase tau, puts more weight on this prior information here to try to remove noise. And of course, if you put too much emphasis, or if your h is bad, you start losing features at some point. So you can see that. Uh, when tau becomes larger, we start losing already some of the useful features, okay? So proximal operator for us is gonna be a denoiser that's specified as an optimization problem of this form, okay? So it turns out this proximal operators is a bridge that will allow us to go from image denoising to solving general imaging inverse problems, and it also will help us to bridge towards machine learning. And this is why I wanted to mention this proximal operator, just a denoiser, okay? So here's a, like one very traditional proximal operator. So uh, what you see here is an image. Here you have a wavelet transform after you start throwing away wavelet coefficients starting from small to large one. And you can see we don't lose quality. It's a very traditional thing. It was at the basis of the interest in uh, wavelet thresholding and compressive sensing kind of spun off from, from this logic. Uh, and it was behind many image compression standards, in particular GPEG 2000. But the real message was that you know, natural images are very well compressible in the wavelet domain. And if we use this, we can use this as a proximal operator and design a simple denoising algorithm by having this L2 term and add this, instead of H, use L1 norm of the wavelet transform. And that would actually promote sparsity in wavelet coefficients. There is a lot of research on this. Uh, but if you would do this, you would end up with a closed form solution, which is known as wavelet threshold. So this is a very simple example. But th this basically shows you that a proximal operator is a denoiser, and this is a specific example that people can use. And you know, this is the example you can see here. So this is an example of wavelet thresholding. As you start increasing tau, you start losing more and more important features in the wavelet domain. Okay, so now let's talk about general inverse problems. So here's a general inverse problem, but now beyond noise, we have other things, subsampling, physics, model uncertainty, etc. Everything is really baked into this H operator here. Now, uh, optimization perspective of this would be something like this, where we formulate it as a minimization problem. Uh, and I put the cost function here that has two terms. There's a data fidelity term, which really is a metric of data fit, and the prior, this H that kind of puts us into the regularization framework, right? Let me give you a couple of examples. So the traditional example is, of course, a 20th century theory of Tikhonov regularization, linear inverse problems, where you have a quadratic data fidelity term and a quadratic prior, you would get a closed form solution. And this is known as kind of classical uh, filter back projection type of approach where you take Y, which is your data, you apply some you know, matrix here, and then you get your denoise or reconstructed image. So of course, the limitation here, the assumption is everything is a caution. Now you can take a more general map perspective where now you say my data fidelity term is just negative log likelihood of uh, uh, of this uh, imaging instrument is everything in here, and my prior is just some statistical prior. And then the art becomes, you know, how do we pick one or the other such that the problem is tractable? Or you can pick a very popular approach, which was really sparsity-based regularization approach, where you end up with a smooth data fidelity. So here I give you an example of L2 term, which assumes a Gaussian noise, and then this matrix, and then non-smooth regularizer, which is non-differentiable function, which, for example, promotes sparsity here. So that's kind of smooth, non-smooth became a very popular framework a few years ago and was extensively used. And really the reason I kind of bring this up is because it will nicely allow me to mention two extremely popular algorithms 
ADMM and FISTA uh, that are used for solving large scale non smooth uh, imaging inverse problems. So if you have F, G plus H, the two algorithms that allow you to really solve them efficiently and used extensively one is ADMM, which is alternating direction method of multivariate, and the second is FISTA, fast iterative shrinkage algorithm. So if you look, the key I want to take away from this one, if you look at those of both of these algorithms and you ignore the third line, which is really, you know, uh, convergence related issues, both algorithms alternate between two things. They go be alternate between G and H, between enforcing data consistency and reducing the noise in the image. So here's a proximal of H, here's another proximal of H. Both proximals are the noisers trying to reduce noise in their input vectors. And the first line here is the gradient descent step with respect to data fidelity. So this is trying to increase data fidelity. Here is this is also trying to increase data fidelity without the gradient by using a proxy. Okay, so those are extremely popular approaches and have been extensively used in inverse problems. And here's a little uh, application from my PhD. Uh, it was all about um, addressing multiple light scattering and sparse regularization in the one framework. So here we used a form of a FISTA with a forward model, data fidelity terms that in, takes into account multiple scattering. And so the goal was, so you have three techniques here, multiple scattering, straight rate, which is just like X-ray, or single scattering approximations. And then on the horizontal, you see 81 holograms, 21 holograms, and six holograms that you're taking. And then you see for each one experimentally reconstructed HeLa cell. So if you take into account multiple scattering and you use sparse regularization, you can really achieve a very high quality reconstruction, even from only six holograms. And this is a 3D image uh, of 512 by 512 by 512 pixels. It's a pretty big image. Okay, so basically I want to summarize this part. This was more like a review of uh, formulating inverse problems. And there are three points. Imaging quality in ill post problems can be improved by using prior knowledge. Sparsity promoting priors were highly effective and popular, uh, but they result in non-smooth optimization and PIST ADMM are really two popular algorithms for addressing this non-smooth regularized inversion. And this is what you know, I call model-based optimization. So PIST ADMM using sparsity and data fidelity is what I call model-based um, uh, regularized inversion. Okay, so basically that's kind of the overview of, of the thing. Maybe I'll take a minute or two if there are any questions so far so we kind of get on the same page. Otherwise, I'll, I'll just go to the next. If somebody has a question, feel free to, to, to add. Maybe I'll take one. Any questions from anybody? Rich. All right, I I'm guess. Proceed. All right, so let's, let's move on directly to the next part, which is an interesting part. So this is a framework I've been working on, which, is, which we called regularization by artifact removal, which is inspired from another framework called regularization by denoising, which will, you know, relate to the previous section. But let me walk, it, walk you step by step. So the question is, right, sparsity promoting transforms have been very efficient. You know, can we do more to represent visual images? And yes, right, so there's been a lot of uh, recent interest in using deep learning to represent visual data. And in particular, we saw that neural nets can be very efficient tools to work with visual images, for images with depth fields, with anything of that type. So here's like one beautiful example uh, from Samsung team where, you know, they use the neural nets to try to synthesize different views given a single image, right? So there are many applications there. By now there are thousands of them, uh, but this is something we want to try to leverage, right? So what's the simplest recipe to do, it, right? This is the simplest recipe I always do whenever I go to my colleagues in medical school, I meet somebody, that's how I get started. Right? So here's a simple recipe to, to apply deep learning to biomedical imaging. Right? So there's a scanner, and you can get two types of scans. You can get a short scan and a long scan. Okay? Long scan has more data, short scan has less data. You do a long scan, then you do some form of kind of traditional image reconstruction, could be inverse Fourier transform, maybe regularized reconstruction, and you're going to get something like this, which I'm going to call gold standard. Now, you can have a short scan, and you're gonna get something like that where you have the straking artifacts. Now what you're really gonna do, you're gonna just train an artifact removing convolutional neural network, which you will try to map this image to something like this by doing supervised learning. So those are our labels, this is the input, we're gonna train the weights of CNN, and this is gonna be output. This is actual output of training uh, data 
in this kind of format. So you can see here's the output of convolution neural network, which does manage to remove uh, artifact. And this technique has been quite um, effective in the past, right? So the, if you know, we take this technique in this thing, we can ask our question, okay, what are the, some of the key benefits of this very simple approach? Where I take a neural network, I give it pairs of a high quality image and low quality image, and I just train it to, to remove the artifacts by looking at the pairs, right? So one clear advantage is, okay, it's very easy to implement and deploy, right? Why? Because, you know, I just download TensorFlow or some framework, a uh, dumb bunch of data that I get from my colleagues in the medical school or in biology or scientific imaging, and I just train it. Uh, it's extremely fast at test time. Once the network is trained, all we need to do is convolutions and nonlinearities, so you can remove the artifacts. Uh, and finally, there is no real need to model anything. We're going to just learn end-to-end, -end, right? So there is nothing to really think about except maybe picking the architecture and some parameters, and, you know, setting it up. So that's kind of a benefit of this thing. But as engineers, we can also ask another question. So what are the, some of the key limitations uh, of this approach, right? Now, I think I want to spend like a, a minute or two and ask actually audience, you guys here, can you point out, you know, a couple of maybe key limitations of doing this kind of simple end-to-end -end learning? So if somebody can do, just unmute yourself and shoot your, your thoughts. Uh, I have my own answers I'm going to show in a second. I'm glad to see hear what people think about this. Question. We had talked about image registration earlier. I yeah. mean, if things are kind of crooked or different angle, how will that affect your training data? Exactly, exactly. So impact of uh, on the training data it seems one of the way you imagine. Anything else? I mean, artifacts say if if you if the artifacts are supposed to model a bad imaging system then from that bad imaging system how are you going to get aligned data for a good subject definitely definitely that's another very good point uh, it's going to be related to my some of my answers i'm going to show uh, one more maybe we'll take one more and then i'll just anybody else wants to you know chip in all right so i think reputation of this you know end-to-end -end learning is pretty strong in this audience uh, so let me put uh, some of them, right? Those are, those are not mine. I mean, I just think of three. So first, we need some form of ground truth. This is related to previous first two questions, right? Okay, the, the training needs some form of, you know, good quality things to be able to train this networks, right? The second, consistency to measure data is not explicit. What do I mean by this? When you train, you make sure to have a closely related outputs to your training labels. But once you apply it to a new data, outside of your training data, now you're not any for anymore enforcing any data consistency to what's coming out of the instrument, right? So that's not kind of explicit. And finally, it does not exploit any known physical models because we know a lot about physics of imaging systems, both MRI and optical diffraction tomography are quite well understood in terms of imaging, but we didn't leverage anything except training the neural net, which learns everything implicitly, right? So basically, that's a question many people have been asking themselves, right? And what, what, what I really want to talk about is this. So there are two ideas, thoughts that have been out there right now to try to address, address this line of thinking. So one, so on the one side, we have these models, which are the models of imaging systems, regularized inversions, priors. And on the other hand, we're learning, right? This end-to-end -end learning, full learning, right? How can we kind of leverage and bring them to others? So there's one line of thought, so which tries to bring learning into models, right? What do I mean? This is you learn something and you learn, put it inside some form of model-based reconstruction. And it really kind of, I spin it off from this paper on plug and play priors that I'm gonna spend a minute to review in a second. But there've been a lot of you know, work around, including you know, by my group here, this is the talk on regularization by artifact removal. And then there's another line of thought which tries to go other way around. We wanna go from models to learning, which basically means you take some form of optimization algorithm, you unfold it, you unroll it, or you do whatever kind of to cut it into chunks, and you try to now train this whole system end to end, right? And that, you know, I kind of credit that the uh, Gregor Lecun paper, Lista, as one of the early works of that, uh, where they tried to do this in the context of sparse coding. There are many papers in that area. I just gave, you know, a few maybe uh, examples that are by no way completely representative. But so really two philosophies, and I really want to uh, focus on the first philosophy here today. That philosophy is basically, we learn something, 
but we don't want to learn everything. Now we want to put it inside a model-based reconstruction to leverage that learn model as an aggregate of some form of information representation. Okay, uh, that's what I really want to uh, talk about today. Uh, so let me review plug and play priors for a second. So in a plug and play priors, the idea is very easy. You say, oh, you know, proximal is a denoiser. Great idea. Let me just try train my neural network to be a denoiser of additive white Gaussian noise. Okay, I just train a neural network by taking synthetic data, adding white noise to it, and teaching it to remove that noise. Okay, that's really the or original. It's not my idea. It was published in 2013. It was a great uh, idea. But the nice thing about here, note that the training here is completely in independent from your imaging system, uh, which basically means all you're doing is your neural network trying to learn features in the image to separate white noise from structure. Okay. Now, once you train this denoiser, now you can use it as a proximal optimization algorithm without, for example, within the ADMM. So here's an ADM algorithm. I replaced the proximal with the noiser. But there was a common misconception that plug and play equals ADMM, which is definitely not true. This whole idea can also go to FISTA uh, by you can replace that proximal operator inside uh, uh, FISTA also by a neural network, and you end up with this type of algorithms. Now, if you look at those algorithms here, Basically, now they have very nice interpretation. Everything you know about your imaging system is in this first line, okay? Your model, it's all baked into this G, which does, you know, it looks too simple for a complexity, but in MRI, this is your data fidelity term in the K space. In optical tomography, this is your data fidelity term with respect to uh, measurements you collect on the camera and the unknown object, and modeling, you know, everything else in terms of light scattering and everything is baked into this. But basically, this guy here tries to get you data consistency. And the second is pre-trained the noising neural network. Only thing it's goal to do is to bring in features you learn on a noisy data set. Okay, that's really what plug and play does. It looks very much ad hoc, but by now it has some interesting theoretical understanding. We're going to get there in a second. But this is plug and play framework. And really what we're really trying to do is we're trying to fuse different sources of information we have two types of plug and play operators, the noisers, and then data consistency type of uh, uh, operators. So this is a data consistency operator, which is a gradient step. And this is another one, which is a, a proxy. You can see both of them go from less data consistent to more data consistent. And the noiser goes from more noisy to less noisy. Really, that's what you're trying to do. Now, that's a plug and play. But what I really want to look into is this, another alternative framework, which is called the RED, which is regularization by denoising which is also another interesting one. And the reason I want to focus on this one is because it has some interesting connections to some other, you know, we're going to talk about it more. But regularization by denoising uh, formulates the same idea in a different way. So you formulate it, you, if you look here, that's basically one basic equation of red, where it really looks like a gradient descent with a step size gamma. This is, looks like a gradient, but in fact, it's not gradient. It's this G is an operator that combines gradient of the data fidelity and the residual of a denoising neural network, right? So what is this residual? So I have a denoiser here. There's an input to denoiser and the output to denoiser. We're really subtracting input to the output and we're combining it with data fidelity and updating our iteration in this way. Now, originally it was formulated by Romana, Milanfar, and Michelat uh, uh, at Technion. And then the idea was, well, if you do this and you add some conditions on your denoiser, you can get a beautiful theory that says if your denoiser is locally homogeneous and has a symmetric Jacobian, basically this optimization problem, this algorithm here will be solving optimization problem where your regularizer has a specific form. Okay? So what is the specific form? You can see the specific form has x minus dx. So it's trying to minimize the, the residual of the denoiser and try to have a uh, or have it orthogonal to the desired signal, which is the x that we want to have. That was from the original paper uh, in Romano uh, et al. And then it was kind of clarified a little in the paper by Rehorst et al. And, but okay, one thing it does happen is that if you take this framework, it comes with a little bit uh, 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 a limitation. It gives you convex optimization based interpretation of this beautiful thing with neural nets potentially inside but it really restricts your class of acceptable denoisers. In particular, you really need to have a homogeneous denoisers, which, for example, a proximals like total variation or L1 norm would not actually, none of the norm-based 
uh, proximal operators would be uh, locally homogeneous denoises. So it's a little bit, uh, this theory doesn't apply as broadly. And the authors are familiar with it if they have, in fact, an appendix in the paper saying that can we mimic any denoises. So the perspective I take on it is a little bit more general, and this is very interesting because original paper is pretty interesting, but it's in fact more powerful than it's stated in the original paper. So the perspective I take is slightly more general. In fact, now you, you can take exactly the same algorithm, but think of this not only as a denoiser, but anything which reduces the artifacts. So artifact, I call it artifact removal network. So it's a neural network that removes artifact. Now we take the residual of this. Now, if you look at it, really the algorithm stops or the converges uh, when this gradient term here, or gradient term uh, with quotes, is zero, right? So we can actually look at this zero set of this operator, which are the, all the vectors such that this g is equal to zero. So even without convex optimization based interpretation, you can get some interesting insights from this perspective. Basically, if you have X star, which is at the intersection of the zero set of data fidelity term gradient and the fixed points of artifact removal neural network. So what, like, let's think for a second about this. Gradient of G equals to zero means you're minimizing, if it's a convex, you're minimizing data fidelity term, okay? Uh, residual equals to zero means, or fixed point of this thing means, x equals r theta x, which means according to this neural network, there are no artifacts in that image, okay? If there is an image which is intersection of this two, clearly it will also be in the zero set of this operator. But more, if in fact there is, even the intersection is empty, then basically x star is, well, trade-off is a wrong word. It's basically a balancing of these two sets. So it's a balancing between data fit and uh, being artifact free according to neural uh, um, artifact removing neural net. Okay? Uh, and that's kind of a perspective we're going to take. But it might also look uh, heuristic, but in fact, uh, you can really build an interesting theory uh, around this whole concept of artifact removal and using neural networks. In, for example, you can prove that under assumptions that your data fidelity term is convex, that there exists a, uh, that, that this fixed point set. Uh, that the zero set of G is not empty, and the fact your uh, denoiser is non-expansive operator, you can show that this algorithm will converge with a rate one over T in terms of the norm of G, okay? So you can, there's no objective function per se because uh, we're not assuming local homogeneity. Only thing I'm assuming is that the denoiser is non-expansive. If you do this, this is backward compatible with traditional optimization with iterative thresholding algorithms or under convexity, not strong convexity, under convexity, or with gradient-based methods. So you're gonna get recovered the same one over T rate of convergence. And you can also see that the norm will go down monotonically with T, okay? Uh, so that's the first point you can do. But another interesting point that original paper really out, uh, it doesn't kind of discuss is that if you take the noise or any implicit proximal operator, if the noise is imitating a proximal operator, you are in fact can be minimizing any objective function corresponding to that implicit operator as one over T plus some term. So this is an error term, which is uh, independent of T. So you see this is up to a fixed error, but it depends on tau. So by taking tau larger and larger, you can make this arbitrarily close to the minimum of the function. So basically the long story short, Look, it might look heuristic, but you can really build on monotone operator theory to really start building optimization-based perspective on this kind of uh, regularization by artifact removal uh, algorithms. And this is what I've been uh, very much interested in, okay? Now, another which is interesting perspective. So once you go beyond the noisers, you can actually start going beyond synthetic database, database training of the prior, okay? So here's a, a, a simple recipe. So it's an adaptation of the paper by uh, ICML 2018 called Noise to Noise. Uh, we adopted it to the MRI problem. So if you don't have a ground truth image available for training, so this X is a ground truth image that I would use for training. However, you can easily get lo two low quality scans, so Y1 and Y2, but they're different. So two different views of the object. Both of them can be undersampled, 
None of them is perfectly sampled. Both of them undersampled. So they're really not, it's not about the noising. They both have striking artifacts, but different striking artifacts. So that's pretty practical. So this could be both one minute scans. So you get two case space data sets. You can do something like pseudo inverse to take them both into image space. Now you can train a neural network to map one of them to the other. Okay? You can really train a neural network to have pairs of two artifact corrupted images. Not all, every single pair is undersampled, but overall, if your whole data set covers the whole frequency spectrum in the case space, you can still obtain an artifact removal neural network. And now you can combine it with, with an algorithm like this uh, here, plug it in here to end up an algorithm that will allow you to do data consistency and uh, remo removal of artifacts. And let me show you uh, how this works. So here's an example uh, from our free, bre free breathing MRI scan. Actually, you know what? Oh, okay, I'm gonna open the four questions in a second, but let me just go over this example. So if you do a, a one minute free breathing scan, you get this kind of data. So this is in a case space, that's the image that you look. If you do five minute scan, and you do sparsity-based reconstruction by using total generalized variation, TGV, you get something like this. But this is a five-minute scan. Uh, so this is a reference image. If you train just end-to-end -end neural network to map this guy here to reference, that's what I discussed as a traditional approach. It's 3D because, in fact, we're doing 3D reconstruction uh, images. Then you would get something like this. So you can see it's quite good. It removes most of the artifacts, and you still can preserve the, the lesions here. Now here, what I called A to A is artifact to artifact. I picked this name, it's like noise to noise, but artifact to artifact, because I don't have noise, I have streaking artifact. If you train by mapping pairs of images like this, but distinct artifact patterns, so you, if you have a five minute scan, I can chop it into five one minute scans and train network one to map one to another, you get this thing. You can see it's slightly better, but it still has artifacts. So it's not using anything from reference, in particular, it doesn't have any biases due to you know, uh, reconstruction of the training data because it's using directly into NFFT. Now, if you take this network, A to A neural network, and iterate within this rare framework, just plug it in here, that network, you're gonna basically get this result. So you can see it cleans up those artifacts quite substantially. And, and the numbers actually you see here, uh, you should interpret them as grain of salt because this is experimental data, meaning I actually don't have SNR, signal to noise ratio. This is all evaluated with respect to a reference, which is a five minute scan, but the reference itself is undersampled. So those numbers don't necessarily represent well, you know, everything you see here. So I would trust my eye more. Uh, so, you know, you can see you can clean it up pretty much better. So you, you see this another realization of this problem where uh, by iterating this network, you get much better than both units that we heard before. But here's a, one thing also I wanna mention is that this kind of algorithm converges quite fast. This is a misconception. Misconception is once we go to iterative algorithms that everything becomes very slow, this is not necessarily true. The reason is we have a pretty good initialization because I take an output already of a neural network and I just do few iterations to fuse the information also from the data fidelity term. And here I show you 10 iterations or nine iterations from one. You can see the, how the quality evolves and then the residual with respect to final solution. Okay, so that's basically a big chunk of my talk was this framework called RARE. And let me, you know, maybe take a couple of quick questions there if there are some things I can clarify. Sure, so this is uh, Santiago, uh, a, a quick one here. So would you mind going back to the uh, to the theorem slide that you had? Uh, to yeah. Uh, so yeah, so this one, so theorem two, so I see that you have, uh, so the second term in the upper yeah. bound does not depend on T, right? Yes, yes. And you said it depends on tau. Tau. Uh, so tau, yeah, so I, I see that tau is that thing over there. So in the definition here of F, so F is G plus H, or is G plus tau H? It's G plus H. Uh huh. So G plus H. So, so F doesn't depend on tau. No, I won't. Uh, no, G. So H depends on tau implicitly, but F ah, H inside H, depends on yeah. tau. Okay, okay. Tau is inside H, but tau is inside basically H. the still, but it still shows that you know the the objective will converge. So. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, yeah. okay. That that was my that was my question. Okay, cool. all right. That's a good question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now. Um, 
Uh, I got another question. Yeah. Earlier on, you mentioned local homogeneity. Yes. A couple of slides before this, I guess. Yeah, so that's a, from this paper by Romano et al. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I just, I'm just curious um, the implications of that. Is that homogeneity in the uh, spatial domain or temporal domain? Yes. What are you referring question. to? That's, yeah, what is the meaning of local homogeneity? So, you know, for like really for a correct perspective on this, I refer you to original paper because it's not my contribution. But here's what I tell you. Uh, basically, what it needs to happen is that you need the denoiser to be homogeneous in the image domain. Okay. So if you have a constant multiplying your image, you want it inside at the input of the denoiser, you want that constant to multiply at the output. So okay. alpha should be able to come out. And then you can already see a problem with that. that it's not for every denoiser this will be applicable. But now, uh, whenever it is true, it is true for some denoisers, then you can actually formulate it in this way, beautiful way. Now, did you use this concept in your work also or, or not? No, no, actually I completely abandoned this. So I just okay. said my denoiser is general neural network. Only thing I impose is that it's non-expansive, meaning that the Lipschitz constant of the neural network is bounded by one. So that's my assumption too in the paper. If you see, there's some technical details, but really there are three assumptions. One of them, there is no homogeneity, but assumption is that neural network is non-expensive. It is, it is non-exact, is that what you said? Non-expansive, non meaning literally oh, okay, one. Okay. Now, okay. So, so here's a side note. In fact, there is a lot of interest in non-expansive denoisers right now because of the, uh, this whole area on, uh, on uh, privacy, preserving neural networks, everything. Basically, there's a lot of interest in training neural networks with Lipschitz constants being bounded. We can leverage all that and train a neural network with a bounded Lipschitz constant. Got it. Thanks. All right, you're welcome. I think for interest of time, I will take more questions gladly at the end. Unless there are like a quick question, I would rather put it to the, to the end. Let's do that. All right, so it's not much left actually. You know, we have like 15 minutes left. So, Basically, to wrap this up, you know, we're really, we're really interested in you know, using neural nets as priors and regularizers. There are different ways to do it. Uh, plug and play and red is like one family of approaches. And I kind of have been building on that to design these algorithms that allow me to address this kind of biomedical image reconstruction problems by taking perspective of you know, regularization by artifact removal. All right, and that's what I talk. And then really quickly, I'm not gonna spend too much time what I want to really spend a second to spend, talk about you know, stochastic variants of this. So this is called Simba algorithm. This is another paper we recently wrote. Uh, but basically, here's a perspective is just like in tomography or optical diffraction tomography, my cost function is not like one function. It's a sum of L terms, all right? And that L is basically, in the case of tomography, each projection. But when you try to minimize this thing, each one corresponds to some form of a wave equation. So it might be very slow to compute the full gradient of this thing. So of course, an easy hack to do is to do stochastic gradient or mini batch gradient, which takes only subset of uh, the projections at every iteration. And this is something you know, we've done and we call this Simba. Um, so instead of taking the full gradient in this algorithm, in rare algorithm, we do mini batch gradient. So uh, it allows you to scale up each iteration depending on the trade-off between B, number of mini, size of mini batch and number of uh, illuminations. So it basically has all the advantages of the other. You still have data fidelity and you still have artifact removal neural network, but now you do online processing of data, right? Now, if you do this, you can again generalize the theory that I kind of showed you. Now you can get the convergence here in expectation that you, know, you converge in expectation to the zero set of G as one over square root of T, which is you know, backward compatible with traditional analysis of SGD. So here it's completely backward compatible. But the beauty is it has an element which just doesn't have a cost function. That CNN, pre-trained CNN, doesn't have an explicit objective function. So really characterizing everything in terms of this G operator here. Okay, it comes from a monotone operator theory. So you know, there's this illustration, I'm not gonna talk. The point is, uh, if you do mini batches, it's faster because you don't do all projection. Each projection is expensive. So now you can really try to do large scale, you know, 3D algorithms and use benefit from neural nets and then 3D imaging. So neural net allows you to get better quality images and, you know, the, the, the Simba allows you to scale up. Uh, so here's an image of 1024 by 24 times 25 images. 
from you know 89 projections where we take 10 projections per iteration to do reconstruction with uh, CNN as a prior. Um, okay, so that's kind of a Simba. Um, and then let me spend, before I go to questions, like a two minutes to give like overview of you know, what my kind of group has been focusing. So I, I really kind of focus on algorithmic aspects uh, of combining you know, uh, imaging operators, imaging systems, sensing systems with machine learning and put it into kind of learning or optimization based frameworks. But really the way I work is, uh, is that there's underlying everywhere, there's an imaging system, so that's a sensing component. And really, you know, I try to follow the progress in biomedical imaging and sensing instrumentation, right? That's kind of one area which I do, but I don't actively build systems. I follow them and I try to keep uh, my knowledge up to them. Now, what I do is on top of the things, I try to build computational systems which in engage directly with imaging systems. But my contributions essentially are um, on fundamental aspects and sometimes applied aspects. So applied means understanding actual data, real data and applying and fundamental is algorithmic signal processing, image processing aspects. And if I'm specific, I look at mathematics of sensing and I'll give you a couple of examples in a second. That's like one thing I really look into details. I look at learning efficient representations of different data sets. So I showed you one, which is using CNNs, right? And finally, design analysis of optimization algorithms so that we can be fast and try to address the problems in a meaningful way, right? This together kind of come into this computational system and in fact, you know, if you look at my past projects, they fall into a different intersection of this. Think for the MRI, optical tomography, deep image priors, you know, all this approximate message passing algorithm. They try to go in the space uh, uh, of contributing to this computational systems, but always keeping in mind uh, the imaging system. And now I want to kind of give you a little bit perspective of my general vision of future, right? So one area I'm very much interested, and that's where I see big benefit, is to try to do all kinds of non-invasive imaging, in particular deep inside tissue, right? Different types of tissue. It could be brain, through skull, tissue, meaning human tissue, could be clusters of cells. But basically the beauty here is you have physical models that allow you to characterize the way light interacts with objects. And then you have all kinds of interesting regularizers you can train uh, uh, through CNNs. And then if you try to intersect this tool, uh, you can really hopefully break some of the barriers in deep tissue imaging. And this is, you know, within learning tomography framework and everything, I've been interested in this line of thinking. And other is try to bring, you know, online sequential real-time algorithms, especially, you know, there's a lot of interest in machine learning to scaling things up. I think it's, ex this, it's as valuable to scale things up in the imaging domain. The difference being now the nature of objects we're trying to recover is images. So there's all kinds of structured information there that we can leverage to try to design this kind of algorithms. And finally, this is my kind of longer perspective. One thing we really want to go towards is try to understand different levels of representation of information from some form of semantic understanding of data, saying this is a cell, this is a background, foreground, all the way to lower level where we say those are edges and low level features. How can we fuse all these things meaningfully into uh, algorithms that can extract maximum meaning from what we have, all right? This is kind of just a little bit perspective, but let me conclude at this moment. Uh, so I talked to you about inverse problems, my rare algorithm, a twist on it called Simba, which tries to scale it up. Everything uses a pre-trained neural network within optimization. And essentially my focus is trying to address biomedical imaging problems by, uh, by putting this kind of things together. So thank you very much. I think this is the right time to stop and take questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's so funny, the clapping. Yeah. Uh, have, we have time for more questions. I guess I have to ask my usual computational complexity Do question. It. All right. Uh, <laughs> so uh, in, in terms of some of these algorithms, I mean, a lot of neural networks are, are very parallel and so can be many times sped up with you know, GPUs or other types of machines. Uh, but for some of the other aspects of that, how, how is the communication or interconnection uh, network? Some of these schemes have a sequential bottleneck. Do you see a sequential aspect that's concerning here or is this very, very clearly, very nice matrix blahs kind of thing, apply all good kinds of 
coup laws and things like that to it, yeah. or you see some some structural issues in the algorithms that, you know, Amdel's law really caused it to really come to a halt. Yeah, this is a great question. And the reason I say it's great, because I can answer it. But <laughs> what, I, <laughs> what I want to say is that, in fact, um, here's a nice thing. There has been a lot of interest, you know, in the general machine learning area right now, because, you know, with this whole federated learning, people interested in training data set, trying to parallelize algorithms, distribute them, doing different things. So basically, most algorithms I told, talked about, I mean, rarely specifically, very much relates to those algorithms. So I, I dabbled a little bit about looking at the communication aspects of, you know, parallelizing the things, doing them more efficiently. But this is a big opportunity area for, for futures that I'm really interested to address. There are different bottlenecks that are there right now that you can really point out very quickly, and I can do it too. And those are begging to be solved over, you know, soon through collaborations, through other people, or through me. Uh, basically, you know, there, there are a lot of opportunities. And, you know, we see it also in other areas where people have been looking into, you know, optimization algorithms, distributed training of using of them, and, and so on. I hope okay. it addresses your question. Yeah, you had mentioned earlier today you had done some sort of an app to help with some image. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, now, how, how was that implemented? Was that done at MATLAB or is that done in actually code that is compilable and efficient? Yeah, so, um, so here's an, the thing. So uh, my code was done in Python, uh, uh -huh. but uh, we, we transferred it to Siemens, who is, a, uh, who is a guy. So this is algorithm, basically. We deployed this rare thing here. So it was transferred to Siemens, and this guy's fully re-implemented it. So we froze our models, everything. So we truncated to 10 iterations, and then they re-implemented everything efficiently. And they don't tell, share with me the details, but as far as I understand, it was done in some, in, I think, C++ or something okay. like that. But I, I don't know exactly the details, because it was already beyond my control. I kind of transferred them Python code and then the models that we trained. Actually, we retrained it on their data. So this one is trained on the, our data, which I collected with my collaborator. We also retrained the model on their data. Okay, very good, thanks. Okay. Uh, I have a question, Rich. Yep. Uh, it is, how, when you're using one of the, like how, how can you know that whether you can trust your proximal algorithm, particularly if it's based on, you know, lear learned from data. Yeah. Can you trust it to not uh, hallucinate or ignore a, say, a tumor in a medical image? Yeah. I mean, that's, a, I think, as deep a question as I can probably get. Uh, this is a great question, actually. And this kind of relates to also traditional model-based optimization, uh, uh, depending on the um, assumptions people do. Uh, but here's my answer. There might be trouble, but this trouble is still better than end-to-end -end learning. So what I want to say is that at any moment, once I have my trained neural network, its impact on solution is controlled by this tau. So in many ways, it's more robust than just using hallucination because I can actually control my data consistency. Okay? So in many ways, I see this as a, as a better version. So in many ways, it's more robust because I can explicitly control and as an engineer i like it i want to have an explicit control saying i trust more this source or this source i weigh them this match with respect to other right so that's really the the best i can say at the moment now of course you can say more if you start dropping in a stronger assumption because the only assumption we've done so far here in this so every analysis all my analysis here was in terms of the convergence to the zero set of g which is basically means this is equal to zero, right? Now you can go beyond that uh, by taking some um, stronger assumption, but some which could potentially be kind of related to traditional compressive sensing. For example, if you take uh, things called um, um, uh, restricted strong convexity, which is related to restricted isometry, isometry property and things like this, you can actually get now solutions in terms of uniqueness of the solutions, unique recovery and so on and so forth. We haven't written these things up yet, but just like you can do these things with you know, traditional optimization, people have been doing it with generative models, you can also do this for this framework. Uh, but okay, let me just now do a, a quickly practical aspect of this. 
the way we convinced Siemens, of course, is only through radiology review. They didn't care about the theory so much. Uh, we kind of did blind testing for radiologists comparing different uh, outputs on the unseen data which was provided to us after everything was set up. Okay, yeah, got it. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Uh, other questions? I have one more question. All right. Is, I don't want to keep everybody, but it's one more question. Yeah. Uh, any, you, you, there are several different you know, application areas that you touched on, right? Imaging application areas. Yeah. And they, they since they're all in, involve inverse problems, you can use these uh, different uh, algorithmic approaches, plug and play, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, is there any uh, sort of, any what? Any general principles that seem to be arising relating you know, the kind of proximal operator needed in the, the particular application. Is that making any sense? Uh, could you repeat? I didn't completely get it. Yeah, I'm just, yeah, it's, a, it'll, it's not a very well-formed question, but just whether there are any general principles that you could see emerging from that would tell, that might give guidance as to what kind of proximal operator you should pick I see. Given, let's say an MRI problem versus, you know, optical tomography. Yeah. Type problem. Yeah. I see. This is a great question. Actually, this is a, a question I think which we will be learning more in the future, in the next few years, because you know, those areas, you know, deep learning got interesting, and guys like me and other people now start looking into deep learning plus things, combining things, and try to get insight. Uh, for example, I know Rich has been looking into, you know, trying to interpret neural networks. Uh, as some form of operator that can be understood. Um, uh, basically, uh, in the next few years, I think we will get a little more insight on this. But here's the thing. So the proximal op optimization perspective is kind of really driven from, or how do I say, it's a misconception, but it's been really inspired from MAP, maximum a posterior probability type of estimation perspective, where you you know, take map, you formulate it as a minimization problem, and proximal is basically a, a sub-minimization problem within, right? Now, with neural nets, what we're seeing is we, we have now much more flexibility in training those guys. So now I can train things for different types of objectives. So I can train it for a specific task. Let's say my goal is not to reconstruct just an image, but later do some form of post-processing that would register it, right? Now I can train a neural network that tends to remove artifacts that are to transform it to something more favorable for the later steps of process. So now, basically, what I wanted to say, again, maybe my answer is not formulated, uh, the flexibility of neural networks is the flexibility to train them the way we care. And this is something emerging, is that we're not anymore only training things to be mapped or to remove the noise but we can be training something with the end goal in, in perspective. People have been thinking of those concepts before, but just deep learning is much more flexible in that aspect. So for example, I can train things to remove specific artifacts. You know, that could be one thing. Like for example, if you do deep, deep tissue imaging, that certain artifacts might be due to scattering, you might train a network which is scattering remover. So then you can use it and combine it with other things inside your processing pipeline or you can train something favorable for registration later on, right? So that's kind of the way I would say it. What's emerging is flexibility of training priors with the end goal in mind. Does this answer your question, Rich? Yeah, no, this is, this is yeah, this is definitely in the, you're right, it's, it's an open kind of issue, but that is, uh, yeah, that, that, that's definitely one, uh, yeah, one potentially really useful direction, yeah. So that's one, yeah. So I, you know, I'm sure like we're gonna see several more as they come through. Um, and yeah, true. Yeah. Okay, I I asked too many questions. Any questions from anybody else? So I have one uh, one question. In the in the end, you mentioned uh, about uh, training in the uh, training in privacy preserving manner and so on. Oh, privacy, no, not it much. Pri yeah, it was training on the without ground truth. Yeah. So, so can you elaborate on on um, 
on what kind of applications do you think this this approach would do well in and what kind of applications would there be a huge difference between oh, yeah. things where you can train with ground truth and without yeah let me just tell you that in many applications that work through there is just simply no ground truth okay like for example mri under motion whatever we do well sorry let me open the image so whatever, no matter what I do, there'll be no, no ever ground truth because even five minute scan with a person inside when they're breathing is not ground truth. It's also under sample. Okay, so there's no realistic ground truth I can have, right? So this reference, that's why I call it reference, not ground truth, is in fact T TV regularized reconstruction. What does this mean? So this guy has its own problems. It has some artifacts. In fact, here's a side interesting note. Um, in the blind radiology review, sometimes this image was rated lower than UNET 3D, which was trained off it. Okay, that's kind of a funny artifact of radiologist's eye looking at those images. But it just means even my reference is not a ground truth. Now, impact here will happen in applications where you really cannot collect ground truth. So it's not, you know, in photography, maybe you will be able to collect, you know, a nice, clean, crisp images to train, but in MRI, under motion, you just can't. Another application in optical uh, tomography, there's always missing information uh, just because you know, the hardware limitations are there, so you will never really have a, a, a ground truth data. However, this perspective offered by noise to noise, and if you kind of combine it with our perspective, I think tells you, look, I can still use those artifact labels and get a meaningful reconstruction. Meaningful meaning a good reconstruction, although I've never seen a single realization of a clean image. Okay, so that's, does it answer Thank your you. question, Ashok? Yeah. I'm actually, I'm very happy to discuss hey, it. Any other open... questions? Okay, well, let's Great thank, talk. Uh, yeah, Great let's, talk. let's thank Google. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Talk to you tomorrow morning. All right. Talk to you, Santiago. Take care. All right. See you. Bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.